Hello, and welcome to Michigan State University Apicultural Extension Spring Webinar Series. This webinar is the first of four that we recorded in the spring of 2020 to help beekeepers get a good start to their beekeeping season. This webinar, First Year Colonies, Getting Ready for Your Bees, is designed to help first year beekeepers get all set up and ready to go for the first year beekeeping so that they're ready when their bees arrive. This webinar is brought to you by your Michigan State University Apicultural Extension Team. I'm Dr. Megan Milbrath, and I'm a researcher and extension specialist in the entomology department, and I coordinate the Michigan Pollinator Initiative. I'm also a beekeeper, and I run a small operation down in Jackson County, Michigan. We're also joined tonight by Anna Heck, who's a research technician in the department, working on a variety of pollinator policy, best management practice issues throughout the state. She's also a beekeeper, and she's recently trained at the University of Minnesota, but has been working with bees all over the Americas, including with Africanized bees. Dan Wines is also joining us. He's our tech transfer team as part of the Bee Inform partnership. He's stationed in Michigan, but he works with commercial beekeepers all around the country, helping them learn best management practices and record data about their operations. He has experience from New Zealand to Canada working in commercial beekeeping operations. Dr. Adam Ingrao is also with us tonight. He's an extension specialist stationed up in the Upper Peninsula. His primary duties are to run the Heroes to Hives program, which is our beekeeping education program for military veterans and their dependents. He also serves as a veteran liaison for MSU Extension, helping staff in county locations work with veterans and develop programming for veterans. He's been beekeeping for about 12 years and still runs hives um, up in the UP. And finally, the last member of our team who's not going to be speaking with us tonight is Zachary Huang. He is a researcher in the entomology department and works on a variety of projects with honeybees. All right, to go through our agenda of what we have in store. So we'll talk to you about some resources that we have at Michigan State University first. We'll make sure that you're actually ready to have bees. We'll talk about purchasing bees. We'll make sure that you have all the appropriate equipment and supplies, you know how to select a site to put your bees, and then we'll go over a very brief overview of the beekeeping season and then leave lots of time for questions. A recording of this webinar can be found at the MSU Apiculture webinar website, which you can find for, by searching for MSU beekeeping webinars, or you can go to our website of pollinators.msu.edu clicking on the resources beekeepers tab and then it'll be in the menu for the webinars. On that site you'll be able to find upcoming webinars, the recordings, and then any links to videos or articles that we mention during the webinar. We're also on social media. We're on Facebook. Look for us under the Michigan Pollinator Initiative and we'll have the recordings there as well and you'll be able to get more information on when we have upcoming events or other webinars. We previously mentioned MSU's Heroes to Hives program as well. You can also find them on Facebook at Heroes to Hives or through the Pollinator Initiative website. The final place you can find us is our MSU Bee Blog, um, which the website is here. You can get through it through the pollinators.msu.edu website. And this posts a variety of things that we're doing, common troubleshooting things that we find, as well as updates from our Sentinel apiaries, which are throughout the state and we do disease sampling from them. We have scales on them so we can see when there is um, nectar flows in each area. We, um, Anna does a really good job of maintaining those colonies and then highlighting things that are happening. So when things are blooming in a region with general maintenance, um, and so the idea with this is that it's supposed to act like a guide for beekeepers in different areas so you can see things that are happening throughout the state. All right, the other thing that is on this website um, is that we have a document that outlines all the beekeeping rules and regulations in Michigan on there. And um, it's, it's worth going through. It's, it's only a couple pages long. There aren't regulations in the state, um, but we want everybody to be good beekeepers. So with these series of webinars, we really want to set people up for success. We want to make sure that people are coming out of the season um, with really strong, healthy hives and they're happy doing it. 
And we also want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that's safe for you and safe for our neighbors. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've highlighted here is Michigan's Right to Farm Act. And one of the things that is underneath that is we have guidelines called the GAMPs, which are the Generally Accepted Agricultural Management Practice. And those are optional guidelines, but basically they're ways to say, like, here is a good way to be a beekeeper in the state of Michigan. And so that you're doing it in a way that's respectful for people, you're doing it, it's kind of like a best management practices. Um, so I highly recommend that people read the GAMPs and follow them. Um, it is also a document that is open for comment, and the comment period is basically right now. Um, so you can read through those and say if you know if you do disagree with stuff or if you think that things need to be changed. Um, but that's a way to make sure that you're being a good and conscientious beekeeper. We have a program called the Pollinator Champions. It's a free program, it's an online course, and it takes like maybe five-ish hours depending. You can draw it out to 10 hours if you want or even longer because there's a lot of supplemental material, but it's videos and articles and activities that um, are all about pollinators and pollination. And the idea is it shows you who are the pollinators in Michigan, why we care about pollinators, why pollination is important, what's happening to the pollinators, and then what you can do to help the pollinators. So the course is totally free. You get all of that for free. If you want to become a certified pollinator champion, you can go on to pay um, a small fee. You get a certificate and you also get to download a PowerPoint slide or slide set and some handouts so that you could go on and give a talk at another organization. So we get more requests for libraries and senior centers and community centers and nature centers. Like we would love to meet them all, but right now there's only a few of us and we just physically cannot go to all the places in the state. And we really do need a lot of people to spread the word about pollinators. So now is a great time, you know, we're, we're stuck inside to so spend the time to learn about that. So again, the pollinators.msu.edu website is the same place that you can go to for that. All right, um, so that was a, a quick highlight of the resources, and then I'm just gonna move on to the are you ready to for bees at this moment. All right. Got bees, and like for decades and decades and decades, if you wanted to purchase bees, the way that you did it was that you worked with a beekeeper who was already established, and you worked with them for a year or two, and then um, the next year in the springtime, you would get splits off of their hives so that you would start your own apiary. And so it is really a craft that has a really long tradition of mentorship. It's only within the, like, fairly recently that people have been able to order things online and to get bees shipped across the country and to just kind of start without having a mentor. And it really does set people up for the process to be much more difficult. And there is a really, really steep learning curve with beekeeping. And so what we're trying to get people to do is without the system of mentorship or for all the people who are kind of just starting on their own to make sure that they understand fully what they're getting into before they engage in the practice of beekeeping. So ideally, your very first season, the only purchase you would make is a veil. Um, so if you get a veil or if you get a jacket and you spend a season working with bees and beekeepers, and then I'll show you a great way to get in touch with a lot of beekeepers. If you have a neighbor who's a beekeeper or you can join your local beekeeping club or you can reach out to us and we can help you put in contact with the beekeeping club. But the idea is that you wanna make sure before you commit to purchasing your animals and your equipment that you actually really like it. So, well, so that would be ideal. If you spent a year really just working with bees you got your hive handling skills down, you understand the basics of management, and then you go ahead and purchase bees. That's ideal. At minimum, we feel that people should have at least read a basic beekeeping book, and most of them are fine. Um, so even like beekeeping for dummies, a lot of people love that book, but um, as long as you have an understanding 
of the basic biology and structure of the colony. Attending beekeeping conferences. So obviously not right now, but we do have lots of beekeeping conferences without the state and they generally run from January until through April. Um, you wanna make sure that you've actually worked with bees before. It's totally normal to be a little uncomfortable in the beginning about having um, a whole colony of stinging insects that are gonna come at you. And, you know, there's definitely, you hear stories about beekeepers who buy their nuke and they put it in their trunk and they get home and they open the trunk and they panic and they hate bees so much at that moment that they can't even get them out of their car. And that's not the situation that you wanna be in. You know, you don't ever just like, purchase a horse if you're a person who's terrified of horses and have never even met one. So you want to make sure that you at least have had some hands-on physical experience with the colony. And then finally, participating in a bee club. So I know like for a lot of young people, the club structure isn't totally something that we're used to. Um, it is you know, there are lots of other organizations that have clubs, but the bee clubs are great because, again, it's going to allow you to talk to other beekeepers, which is really important because you have to figure out what people are doing in your area at a certain time. And then it's also really important because it allows you to have a lot of more hands-on and in-hive experience. Um, there's just not going to be anything that replaces in-hive experience a state organization which is Michigan Bees or the Michigan Beekeepers Association and this is their website michiganbees.org and that state organization is the umbrella for a variety of local bee clubs and this is in the process of getting updated there's been even a couple since um, this screenshot was taken and so um, these bee clubs are going to be all over the state you can go to michiganbees.org there's a tab for maps and then you can click on any one of these sites and it will give you the local information for when that club meets. It'll give you information for when, um, how you contact them. All right, so if you're at the point where you haven't done that yet, so let's say you're just like going off the internet and thrilled with bees, it really isn't too late to cancel your order. Um, and that does sound kind of harsh and dramatic, but what we see and like one of the things being an extension is we get all the calls of the people who are struggling and suffering. And we want beekeeping to be like this fun, happy, healthy endeavor. And the people who go into it too fast, it's just too much of a challenge. And normally what we see is that people get bees, the first couple years, their colonies die. And then they purchase more bees and the colonies die. And they purchase more bees and their colonies die. And about the third or fourth year, they really get serious about bees or they quit beekeeping. And they sell their equipment and they've just thrown this, they've killed a lot of bees and caused a lot of disease to spread. So what we need to do is make sure that you're getting them at the point that you're actually ready to be prepared to take care of them. So it's not too late to cancel your order for this spring. If you're not at, you know, met those minimum requirements, buy a bee suit, join a bee club, offer to help other beekeepers and also find ways to actually help bees. The thing that we need, like we don't need more beekeepers, we need more flowers. And so the thing that you could do, regardless of your decision to buy or not buy bees, is to help plant. One of the big methods that we wanna get across is that, like I'm, and I'm talking about this from a person who has really very little life outside of bees. I think that bees are the most fascinating things. I do bees in my free time. I do them at work for all of my job. It's all bees all the time. But I don't think that it is good for the environment and it's not helpful for bees. I keep bees because it's a business. I keep bees because it's a wonderful hobby. Um, but it's not it's not a thing that I'm doing that is making the world a better place. And that's a really, really common misconception. Uh, the analogy I use, so here in this photo, you can see on the left is a beautiful bird that's a Kirtland warbler, which is native to Michigan. It's very rare, it was threatened. 
on the right you see some backyard chickens. The example that we use is that keeping honeybees to help the bees is like getting back chickens to help the Kirkland warbler. At best, what we can do is to make sure that our actions when we have chickens, that we don't create a bunch of diseased birds that are going to transmit diseases to our native um, bird population. At worst, we can actually affect them negatively. And this is what we're seeing um, with this huge interest in beekeeping is that a lot of people are getting bees. Many of those colonies are dying from disease. And as they die, those diseases are spread to other bees. And then, and this includes, now we're seeing some of those diseases show up in our native bee population. So if you take our pollinator champions course, you learn all about the like 460 different native bees we have in the state, which are lovely. And we want to make sure that our actions, so if we're choosing to be beekeepers, that we're prepared to do it in a responsible way, that we're having the minimum impact on the environment as possible. So if you are doing this because you want to help the bees, what we really recommend is you can go to our website, find the tab that says help the bees, and you'll find all sorts of things. So you can read about the impact of beekeeping on the environment. You can become a pollinator champion. We've got tons of resources about how you can improve the landscape for pollinators. We've got a whole list of citizen science projects, um, how to work to remove bees, help and get involved with beekeeping organizations, and even how to advocate um, to be a better, so that we have better policy to help support our pollinators. In this next section, Adam's going to talk to you about purchasing bees. We also have the same information available in a video on our YouTube channel, so look for Michigan State University Beekeeping, and we'll make sure that it's available in the show notes. One of the things when you're thinking about purchasing bees, you're going to have some options, and the options really that you have are the difference between nukes and packages. So a nuke is essentially uh, is, is short for hive nucleus, which is essentially a fully functioning beehive that is in a, usually five frames is what you buy a nuke as. You'll generally have a frame that is full of eggs, a frame of hatching brood, a food frame, and then a frame and then a room for expansion in another frame. So you've got all the elements of a of a fully functioning beehive, including a laying queen. So when you get a nuke, that nuke is ready to go. You just basically take that nuke, the five frames out, and install it in a beehive. Now, you also have the option for packages, and packages usually come in the form of two or three pound packages. Now, packages are something that you can think of as kind of like a swarm of bees. It's basically just a bunch of bees in a box with a queen in a cage. And so there are advantages and disadvantages of both of these. And for us in northern climates, one of the big disadvantages of a package is that if you get a package too early and you're installing it on new equipment, meaning that your frames don't have any drawn comb, that package of bees cannot actually cluster to thermoregulate their temperature when we have cold spells. So for example, if you were to have gotten bees last week and installed them into new equipment in lower Michigan, well, it was nice last week, but then we ended up getting a snowstorm that came through. And when that snowstorm comes through, those bees are gonna cluster to maintain temperature. And if they cannot cluster because you do not have drawn comb in new equipment, that package can freeze. And we see that very often, uh, particularly up in the UP. I, I see a lot of folks who will be selling packages way too early in the UP. And if an individual purchases those, and is, does not have drawn comb and resources to have for that bee colony, that bee colony could potentially uh, die. Now, the, the flip side of that is with the nuke, you have a fully functioning colony. So that colony, it can cluster, it has drawn comb, and it will be fine in those types of uh, situations. Now, there are some other caveats to this. One of the big things for nukes is that they're not always available. Generally, you're going to purchase nukes from someone locally, and Megan had touched on the fact that it's important for you as a beekeeper to be connected to your local bee club and even your state-level bee club, because that's generally where you're going to find packages, or I'm sorry, nukes from. Now, when it comes to packages, you can pretty much buy packages from anywhere. You can go on most of your beekeeping supply company pages and be able to purchase those outright, and they'll mail them right to you. Now, the thing about packages is they're widely available, but when you get them, 
um, you have some some challenges if you if you're on new equipment. Now, if you're in the season and it's it's warmed up, you're you're going to be just fine installing a package. But you need to know that there are some some advantages and disadvantages to those, and and we talk about those in that video. Uh, the other thing that you need to be mindful of when it comes to nukes and packages is that nukes generally are a little bit more expensive than packages, and so you need to you need to be aware of that as well. In addition, when you purchase a package or a nuke, you need to know exactly what you're purchasing. You need to understand what you're getting as far as a nuke is concerned. Is it is it maybe a three frame nuke instead of a five frame nuke? Um, that's something that you need to have a conversation with the person you're purchasing from. In addition, you want to make sure that you have a young mated queen that's in that nuke. Uh, so that's another question that you need to ask. Now, generally with packages, when you get those imported uh, from other states, you know, generally those those packages have have been in transport. Um, they do undergo a little bit of stress during that period, um, but they generally wherever you're getting packages from, uh, those packages are usually if they're from a reputable uh, supplier are usually in very good shape. So you shouldn't be really concerned about the quality of the bees that you're getting, but you need to understand exactly what you're purchasing, and uh, especially when it comes to the status of the queen. Uh, when you're when you're buying those uh, types of things. So purchasing bees is something that you need to plan for. Uh, generally, when I'm telling folks that they need to think about purchasing bees, uh, I tell them that they need to think about that in the early part of the season. So even now that we're here near the end of March, it's going to be more and more difficult to find nukes for sale because those generally uh, will be purchased very quickly. And there's just not as much of a supply for nukes as there is uh, packages. Now, one thing I'll leave you with as, as we kind of wrap this up is that you know, one thing that you need to consider is when you become a beekeeper, um, you are part of the community of beekeepers. And it is your responsibility as a beekeeper and a, and a contributing part of that community to create bee colonies. So making nukes, um, local nukes that are available to folks in your area, that's an important part of, of the evolution of a beekeeper. And so as you continue on your beekeeping career, always keep in mind that although you're purchasing nukes and packages, um, it is something that you should be thinking about as you become a better beekeeper that you need to be contributing back to your beekeeping community uh, in the form of locally raised bees. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm going to watch the question and answer to see if there's any questions on purchasing bees. So we had one come in over email. It said, as first year beekeepers, should we quickly requeen our package with a locally bred queen or should we use the package queen for the first year of drawing comb, establishing the colony, etc. first? As I think Adam mentioned and what's mentioned in the video is that it is important for you guys to just get bees in your hive and we'll talk about getting the colony kind of established first and then you always one of the unique things about bees is you can just always change the genetics whenever you want um so it's very different from like a dog where you know if you have a labrador and then you're like you know what i think a border collie would be really fun you can't just switch it out with bees though you can just switch the genetics at any time the queen is the one who has the genetics and you can replace her so what we recommend is that you get a colony just get it in your hive get it established get them to draw out the wax and then later in the season which would be like late summer early fall you replace the queen so that you have a young queen and at that point there's going to be lots of local queens available um a lot of people want local bees and the thing about Michigan is we have garbagey weather late into the season and so we can't start raising bees till really late. If you guys are just starting out those extra couple months make a difference for you. So you can get bees from anywhere but then you can always change the genetics later. So a lot of beginners get really focused on like do I need a Saskatraz, do I need a VSH, do I need this, do I need that and just get bees because you can always switch it. So don't don't panic so much about finding the best bees. It's not the same as like finding the best stock. So there's a question that says, when using the medium brood boxes, how many frames in a nuke? So a nuke is not a formally defined thing. Um, so usually people will say, I'm selling five frame nukes or four frame nukes, or I'm selling an eight frame split or things like that. So as Adam mentioned, you want to know what you're purchasing. So usually people are going to sell a five frame nuke. 
Um, a lot of times a medium is going to be the same price as a deep because most of the cost of the nuke is really in the labor in producing the nuke, in raising the queen and getting it up um, to set. Okay, another question from the chat. Are nukes created from brood and honey frames from any hive and a newly introduced queen or are they always established colonies? Usually the, the nukes are made up that spring because you do want a young queen in them. So beekeepers will take frames out of the their existing hives and you're kind of creating like a starter package. So generally they'll have three frames of bees, a frame of honey, and usually like a project frame will make up the five frame nuke because um, you want them to have a little space to grow. There is a question about will they mail packages to Florida when it's cold in Michigan? They mail packages all the time and the postal service and the shipping companies do not do what is best for bees. Um, and so you have to make sure that you are paying attention. Um, I, I would rather not have people just order bees from the internet or from um, stores. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting the bees from a local bee club because then you'll be able to work with other people of when they're coming in. It's also really important to note that the bees, you know, these are environmentally sensitive animals that are getting shipped across the country. And so even in a year without a pandemic, when things are more certain, you don't know exactly when they're going to arrive. And so the people who are making them up on the other end are going to be um, working really hard to get them out on a certain date. And the people who are shipping them are going to be, or driving them across, are going to be really hard, to, working really hard to drive them. But we have to be really careful that we're not trying to ask them to do something they can't do. They don't just have like a warehouse with bees and they pull them off once, you know, so-and-so from Michigan decides they want a hive. There's a huge long process that goes. It takes weeks to actually create a nuke um, and to get the queens and things like that. So you can't say, oh, they're supposed to come on the 10th, and then if they don't come on the 10th, that that person was not treating you right. They'll give you a date of they should come in around the 10th, and then you have to be flexible. And that's actually a really good indication of whether or not you should be a beekeeper, because if you can't be flexible within a couple days and your schedule so tight, then you might not be able to provide the bees with the care they need through the rest of the season. Um, there's a question from Brian that says, what is the size of nuke I should order to start with for a horizontal hive that can hold up to 40 frames? So with the horizontal hives or the alternative hives, you have to make sure that your hive will actually use standard Langstroth frames. Um, if they don't use standard frames, then you're going to have to purchase a package or that'll basically be your only option. Um, but usually you don't get to choose the size of nuke. Most of them, even though it's not standard, um, most of the producers would be using a five frame nuke. And a good five frame nuke um, will be pretty good. We had one more question from uh, Facebook regarding how the, will the new regulations that are out for corona affect the delivery and transport of bees this season? Yeah, I mean, that's a, who knows? It is a very, very, very uncertain season. It's already very uncertain. And so having more uncertainty, for those of you who this is your first introduction into agriculture, I think it really will give you an, an honest sense of what it's like to be participating in agriculture. Agriculture is uncertain. When you're working with national systems, it's just going to be really uncertain. I and mean, the, the nice thing is that beekeepers are really good people overall, and you're going to either be able to get, you know, you're, you're going to have to work with the person, like if you've already put a deposit or things like that. Um, if you don't end up getting bees this year, then make sure you just get tons of hive time. It's, I think, the, the way that it is. And just be really flexible. You're, the people who are supplying you with packages and nukes, I can 100% guarantee are way more stressed out about the situation than they are. For some people, it's their entire livelihood. Um, so we want to make sure that if we're, if we're stressed about our hobby, that we're being really gentle to the people who are stressed about their livelihoods. Okay, so there's the question that is how to decide on the variety of bee to order, Italian, Carnelian, Saskatraz. With that question of what type of bee to order, I don't think that you should worry. Um, the first few, there are differences between the different genetics. 
but those differences are super nuanced compared to the um basically be between the differences of your management. So the first few years, you just won't notice the differences between those style of bees. So a good beekeeper can keep any of those style of bees alive in Michigan. Um, and you won't really know which one fits with your management strategy until you A, have a management strategy, which will happen after a couple years, and B, really like understand some of those some of those nuances so what i would recommend is just get bees in your hive the first year and then start ordering bees and try new ones out like i said you can always switch them out so one year try and then the next year try one of each and you know because you are going to have to have young queens in your hives so you do have lots of opportunities to try them all right, so we're going to see if Dan is ready to chip in about equipment and supplies. Thanks, Megan. Um, we'll talk um, just briefly on um, some of the tools of beekeeping, if you will. Um, not get super in-depth here, but just kind of an overview as a, you're going to begin as a beekeeper. Um, here you're basically looking at three things, which are, you know, beekeeping is considerably more difficult without those three things. <laughs> And you can do just about anything you need with those three things. So we've got a smoker, a hive tool, and a bee veil. And that's um, really the basis of it all. There, there's certainly more to it than that, but that gets you a, a good start. Um, probably first and foremost, what I think about is, is the hive tool. And that, that's really your connection between you and the colony being able to um, open, manipulate, examine, everything you want to do in the hive is going to be greatly facilitated by a hive tool. Um, you know, as, as you get to experience um, working in a beehive, you will realize very quickly that things get very well glued together. There's a lot of weight involved. Beekeeping equipment's built to pretty precise tolerances, so it does fit together. That means once it's been together for a while, it's hard to take apart. So Hive tools at their simplest, it's basically just a lever. Um, really the key is, is finding something that's comfortable for you, something that you like the, the feel of in your hand. Um, you know, you see this one on the left has some extra, an extra hook on the end. Some folks use that for kind of levering and um, flicking frames out. Most of them have some sort of, um, the, the holes in the bottom are for pulling nails, um, additional holes for if you're making frames out of wire. There's a lot of versatility. The main thing is they all work. It's a matter of personal preference, comfort. Get something you like the way it feels in your hand. If you work with tools in any aspect, you know that that feel is important. So there are some nuances, but um, like I said, but largely a function of personal preference there. I will say on Hive tools, it's good to, just for general biosecurity, um, you want to keep your hive tool clean because that is the instrument you're going from hive to hive with. So you do kind of want to be mindful of cleanliness, sterilization between colonies, certainly between yards. And as new beekeepers, you're not going to have multiple yards right away, but just be operating in the mindset of your, your hive tool is your point of contact in the beehive. So be mindful of keeping it clean. Um, the, the next kind of critical tool in the, in the, the beekeepers, um, you know, toolbox is, is the smoker. Um, really, we use smoke to control the bees. Um, you know, if, if, if you do are able to get out before you have your own bees, get out, see with a mentor and see when a colony gets a puff of smoke, how the bees behave, um, they disperse a little bit. They calm down. You know, there's different thoughts amongst beekeepers about why smoke works. The most convincing argument I've heard is, a lot of their communication is via pheromones, um, and it kind of disrupts that a little bit, putting smoke in the air. Um, so it, it, it calms them down, it delays the, uh, or interrupts the transmission of like alarm pheromones. So little bits of smoke here and there, you're not over smoking, you're not using a lot, just a little gentle puff now and then, um, you'll see how they respond to it. Um, a word on what you wanna burn in that smoker, you definitely want cool smoke. You don't want to be puffing something hot on your bees. You don't want to be throwing ash into the hive. Um, as far as what you burn, lots of options. You know, some people like cedar shaving. Some people like wood pellets. I like burlap. Um, in the south, they burn a lot of pine straw. It's kind of a function of what's available. 
the main thing is you you don't want to be throwing up hot smoke. You don't want to be creating a fire hazard in the environment or in your beehive or in your vehicle. Um, so something that's going to burn well for you, but not throw ash. That's important. You also don't want something um, that's got any sort of insecticide in it. I ran into some beekeepers a few years ago that burned baling twine, and then they realized that was uh, had some insecticide in it. So you want to be mindful of what it is. But natural leaves, pine straw wood chips, those sort of things work well um, for smoker fuel. Also the smoker, one thing to know if you're gonna go out shopping for one, this one on the right's got a cage around it. That's really useful. Um, one, it uh, the smoker's gonna get hot. You can kind of see the, the metal there, it's changed color through repeated heating. Um, so having that little extra um, cage around it's gonna prevent you, know, you just inadvertently grabbing it, touching it, burning yourself. Also a good place to tuck your hive tool. I kind of work, if it's not in my pocket, it's in my smoker. They just kind of go together. Um, so, and then the other aspect, um, kind of the, of the, the three essential pieces of equipment um, would be a veil or a jacket. Um, again, that's gonna be a, a personal preference kind of on how much protection. Um, you know, here, pretty common people starting out, I think I wanna be, you know, I don't want to get stung up. I'm going to get the full suit, the zip on hood like this one's got. Um, certainly an acceptable option. I wear, you know, full suits different times. Um, th there's a little bit of a trade off between um, being hot and sweaty and a little more protection. But I also think you don't want to be so suited up that you're approaching, um, you know, working with and getting to understand your bees with a, with a fear of being stung because that's part of it if you're going to be a beekeeper you're going to get stung you're going to learn lots of ways to minimize that but it is part of it um i generally work in a jacket or if i get particularly when it's hot and i can get away with it just a pocket veil and a helmet because i'd rather um, have good ventilation be keeping you're lifting heavy stuff you're doing it in the summertime it's hot um, so the main thing, again, with, with a lot of things, it, it is some personal preference, but, you know, I, I think it's important to think about, um, you know, when you think about your equipment, there's kind of these trade-offs between how much protection, how much ventilation, convenience, those sort of things. Um, so lots of different styles out there in the bales. Um, think about visibility and ventilation because it's something you're going to be, you're going to have, have on your face for um, a while. So if you can put one on before you buy it, see how your vision, your periphery and things like, you, you want to be comfortable in, in the bee yard and around your bees. So that's an important consideration when, when getting your, you know, your jacket, your veil, whatever it is. Um, okay. On gloves, you notice that picture, that beekeeper didn't have gloves on. I say it's one of those aspects, um, you know, if you're beginning and you're really afraid of getting stung, that's, somewhat understandable but it's something you're going to want to get over getting a few stings is not the end of the world or um you know it's it's something to get some experience with it hurts but it goes away um i started myself a lot of beekeep most beekeepers probably do start with leather gloves um you know they offer the most protection but there's a couple downsides to those. One, they're fairly thick. You, you kind of lose a, a bit of feel, touch. You're a little more clumsy working in the hive. You're probably going to just pinch more bees inadvertently and picking up frames. Um, another concern, too, is, is from, a, like we mentioned with the hive tool, kind of the, the biosecurity aspect of spreading stuff hive to hive, yard to yard. It, it's not really possible to sterilize leather gloves. Um, they've got little nooks and crannies that things can get into. So um, that, that's something to be, to be mindful of. Um, with getting into your bees without gloves, it kind of forces you to slow down, be mindful, pay attention to the bees, their behavior, their tone, where you're putting your hands, how you're moving. If you, if you touch something, if you're going to lift the frame, um, mindful that you're not going to grab and squish a bee. So, so it does kind of promote a slow and careful, deliberate um, beekeeping, which is going to be good for you and for your bees and your handling of the bees. Um, one nice place to kind of land in between those two options is the nitrile gloves. Um, it does offer some degree of protection from getting stung on the hands and wrists. Um, but it also offers, you know, being disposable, um, you know, you can peel them off 
change gloves between hives or between yards, that sort of thing. So it kind of offers some protection, but also some a, a method of cleanliness. Um, so those are kind of just things to consider when thinking about gloves in your hands. Beekeeping is very much a hands-on thing. So what goes on your hands, if anything, is, is something to think about. Um, I think before we go on, we've gotten a bunch of questions. So I think um, if, if we can talk briefly about them. So there's quite a few people want to know how to sterilize hive tools. I think Anna knows that process really well. <laughs> that's, that's, Megan's joking because what she's saying is we did it a lot this summer when we were doing research. Uh, so one way that we do it in the field is we bring, uh, we have a jug of water, a jug of bleach, like a plastic tub, and then some Comet or just um, dish cleaner stuff and a green scrubby pad. So we can make a, we'll let, we'll make a bleach solution and then we'll let the hive tools sit in the bleach and then we'll use Comet and the green scrubby pad to scrape the hive tools. So that's one option. Um, I sometimes will bring my own hive tools home and I'll soak them in hot water and that makes it a lot easier to get some of that wax and propolis off of the hive tools. Um, so those are a couple of ways. Some beekeepers uh, use flames, but I will tell you that if you just use a flame to heat up your hive tool and burn the wax and propolis off of it, it will probably burn your hand if you grab it accidentally. So that's a, a trickier one to use. And the, the big key with the, the sterilizing and keeping it in between um, is, one is you don't have to do it between every hive but two is you wanna make sure that you get all the material off the tools. So wax, propolis, honey, things like that. There's a question on here is if it is really necessary and we, you do wanna make sure that you're at least not transmitting things between yard to yard. So within each yard where you've got like a group of bees together or group of hives, you can assume that they're going to be kind of mixing, but from yard to yard, you do wanna take, we do wanna take biosecurity and disease transmission seriously. Um, yeah, like as Anna mentioned, you can do it in the field or what I do is I have a whole, um, I have a part of my truck that has clean hive tools. After I use them, it goes into a dirty hive tool bin and then I just bring them home and wash them all together. Um, there's another question about whether or not we can use old jeans for fuel. And there's also a request for people to, for the whole panel to kind of talk about things. So um, I think, a, you can use old jeans as long as they're just cotton for fuel, they are pretty harsh. Um, but I think if we wanna talk about like, so what I tend to use is pine needles or sumac, or I just buy a big bale of pine shavings from Tractor Supply in a big bale and just use those. Um, Adam, do you have any other things that you use in addition? Um, I actually use a lot of pine cone residue. We have a ton of squirrels on our farm and they leave residue everywhere from pine cones. And so we use a lot of that. Oh yeah, also wood chips like from mulch and also um, the egg cartons, obviously not the styrofoam ones guys, but like the cardboardy ones. So there's all sorts of things that you can use um, in a smoker fuel. I definitely would not spend money buying smoker fuel. Um, the world is full of smoker fuel. There is a question on, um, Dan, if you want to address this. When I went to buy a smoker, there were two sizes. Any recommendations and pros and cons? Yeah, so I think you, it's, um, it's like a seven inch tall can and a 10 inch. I think they're all pretty well the same diameter. Um, major difference is you, your 10 inch, your bigger one's probably going to burn a little bit longer before you kind of need to repack it. If so, if it, you know, it's a lot of commercial beekeepers that kind of don't want to have to fuss through it repeatedly throughout the day, it's more of a low maintenance. But if you've just got a couple hives, of, of the smaller size is going to be totally adequate. Um, Excellent opinion. Um, so this is Anna. I prefer the shorter smokers for most of my work because they're easier to open. So sometimes after you use a smoker for a long time, there's some um, gunk and everything that can build up. And if you have the shorter hive tool, sorry, shorter smoker, it's easier to use a hive tool to pry open that top lid. Uh, Dan will probably say that you can just clean the smoker and that's another solution. 
Excellent. And then the last question is, could each panelist say what type of veil they have and why? Yeah, so I've got a whole variety and it really is, is um, dependent on what kind of scenario I'm walking into. Um, when it was all bees every day and moving bees at night, if I'm, if it's, um, you know, if I'm walking into commercial bee yards or working on a, at a time of year or weather when the bees are not going to be as pleasant, I'm going to put more gear on, um, probably at least the jacket, um, and some, you know, jeans or pants with kind of tight fitting cuffs at the ankles. But if it's a nice day, I'm able to pick my spot and it's a 75 degree day and there's a nectar flow on and the bees are happy. Um, it's probably just going to be a pocket veil and a t-shirt or maybe just kind of a lightweight long sleeve button up, um, you know, so situation dependent. I, I agree that it is really nice, this is Megan, to have a variety. So I recommend that everyone get a veil to start because that's 15, 20 bucks. It's your cheapest option and you can always wear long sleeve shirts. And then if you feel like you want to get a suit or you want to get a jacket or you want to get other things, like there are some times that I use a suit. Um, it's really, really rare. Most of the time I just wear a veil and if I want more protection, I'll wear a veil with a long sleeve button up shirt. Um, and then it's always nice to have another one on hand because then if people want to come visit or you want to take people out in the bee yard, it's nice to have a second option. Adam? Yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of have them all as well. Well, I say I have a jacket and a, just a face veil. Most of the season, I just use a face veil and a, just a t-shirt um, works fine. Uh, but when we get into robbing seasons and things get a little hot near the fall, um, I will sometimes put a jacket on uh, just to kind of ease up the pressure on myself. And then the final question on PPE is, I'm um, planning on using nitro gloves, but there's, they are going to be hard to buy soon. Um, the next best recommendation. Honestly, this is something we talk about a lot. The best recommendation is to not wear gloves when you're working your bees. Because you can, A, you can wash your hands, and B, you can really feel what you're doing. If you are, I do have gloves, like leather gloves that I wear a couple times a year when I need to, but most of the time you're going to get stung less when you're not wearing gloves because you aren't gonna be smashing bees and you're gonna be moving more carefully. All right, so for the sake of time, um, we're gonna go fairly quickly through the different types of feeders, and then we're gonna go um, through the types of hives as well. All right, Dan, do you wanna just kinda of highlight yeah. the feeders? Yeah, so when you get your bees, um, whether they come in package or new, you know, Adam kinda of outlined the differences, but they are going to need feed. Um, we understand other types of livestock get fed, other you know, pets get fed. Bees, bees need to be fed, particularly new bees just starting out. They've got a real uphill um, to, to draw the wax they need to kind of fill out the colony, to kind of mature as an animal, as a unit. They've, they've got to fill those combs with wax and store food in them. To do that, they need feed, namely syrup, sugar, um, so one way to feed them is this gravity or bucket feeder. Um, they either have mesh or some holes in the lid. You invert it on top of the colony, um, on top of the inner cover, which you'll see a picture in a minute. But basically the bees access it from directly below. And um, if it's set up right and not leaking, it won't drip on them. They're kind of works on a principle of like a hamster feeder. They'll take a drop, you know, they can, they can get at it with their tongue. Uh, alternatively, that can be mason jars. Essentially, it's gravity feeders. Any container that you're going to invert on top of the colony, either through an inner cover or through the lid. So if you, like, very common setup here, you see the bucket resting on the inner cover, and then there's kind of an empty box um, to protect that, and then you can put the lid, uh, telescoping lid on top of that. So it'll give, the, it'll give the weather protection, but that is essentially open to the underneath from the bees in that colony. Um, so that empty box um, kind of contains that system. Um, the other primary option that's used is a frame feeder. Um, and so this is going to go inside, just like you've got your, you know, eight or 10 frames in the box. This is going to replace a couple of them. Typically they hold a gallon. They do come in a little bigger size, so one and a half and two gallons as well. Um, the cap and ladder has these uh, cylindrical tubes that kind of keep the bees from, they can climb down, but 
This is a deconstructed view here. The, you can kind of see these mesh cylinders. The bees can go in and come out without falling in, drowning, dying. So this is going to be kind of in hive as opposed to on top of the hive. The top feeder is another option, another piece of woodware where essentially it's got trays on top of the frames that you pour bulk feed into. Again, you want to sort of give some sort of float. That's going to feed a lot, um, you know, a lot at once. So if your bees are long ways away from you, that may be a preferable option. And then the last option is uh, an entrance feeder or a boardman feeder. And these are kind of little mason jars, you know, probably better to use a bigger jar. Um, <clears throat> it, one particular issue is when you've got these small units um, in the springtime, weather's still pretty um, up and down temperature wise. If it's too cold, the bees aren't going to be able to kind of break their cluster and go get that food. Um, whereas the bucket feeder, it's kind of right above them. It's, it's right where they need it with, with minimal um, distance to travel. Um, and also an issue with these um, in the fall and with robbing, um, it may attract kind of pressure to the entrance. It's a food source right at the entrance of that colony. So it might, it might attract some kind of unwanted visitors that that colony has got to defend itself from. Um, the nice aspect of these is as starting out, you can visually see how quickly that syrup disappears and it kind of gives you a mindset of, okay, this, this, this animal, this colony of bees is, is consuming the food provided at a certain rate and so you kind of have a bead on um, when they need a resupply if you want to keep a steady stream of it going to them um, so they can say is they can fill that wax and, and draw out that comb. Um, so now that kind of covers say the basics of feeding. We'll get more into that in, in upcoming weeks but I think Adam's going to talk a little bit more now about some of the kind of hive design woodware that sort of stuff that kind of rounds out the equipment basics. Yeah, thanks, Dan, very much. Okay, All right, we're ready for um, the... I'm just going to oh, do ahead, interrupt Dan. for a question. So there is a question about um, how the actual gravity feeders work. Um, I think we did zoom quite through it. The way that this works is that the bucket is upside down. It does have this screen that the bees can access, and it's upside down over a piece of wood, this is the inner cover that has a hole in it. So the frames are below, the bees can access that hole. Um, there, the, the bees can access that hole. Basically it will form a vacuum and then the bees will be able to just suck it down. And the second point that we wanted to make is, so our recommendations for Michigan is that you have a something that you are prepared to have something that feeds syrup um, and it has to be something that holds at least down. It can be multiple mason jars, it can be a one gallon bucket, it can be a top feeder or it has to be a frame feeder but what we don't want is people to do like in this picture shown here where they have you know like a little tiny quart jar on the outside of the hive. Um, we In Michigan, because of the cold, you need something that's going to be right next to the cluster that the bees can access without going outside the hive. And you have to think about things um, with on the gallon terms. All right, so Adam's going to hit the hives up. Okay, so we get this question a lot. What is the best style hive to use? And, and really, the answer to this is both it's regional, depending on where you're at, some hives work better than others, and it's also a lot of preference. So I will say this, so the Langstroth hive is the traditional hive. You see here we have top bar hives, Warre hives here as well, and there's advantages and disadvantages to all of these. The big thing with the Langstroth hive is that it is a modular hive design with frames that are able to be removed and moved. Uh, individually and it allows the individual to work the hive very easily you're able to inspect all the frames and really that is one of the big advantages of that um, with with us in northern climates in particular you need to have a high volume of food and space to be able to accommodate that food as it comes in in michigan our our season is very short and we have a lot of resources in the form of nectar coming in that has to be stored very quickly. And you can see this Langstroth hive here is 10 boxes high, I think, two, four, six, seven boxes high. So it's a very tall hive, but you have to have that room in order to basically 
loc or put all of that food in. You see this apiary here, this is kind of the normal size of a Michigan apiary during the honey flow. And this may seem a little astonishing to some of you, but this is, this is what we see in Michigan very regularly. And so you have to have the ability to add room very quickly. Now, when you think about hives that don't use foundation um, or, 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 or not using foundation like Langstroth hives, oftentimes you can get yourself bottlenecked because they have to develop that comb before they can actually store food in it. So that is one of the luxuries of the Langstroth hive is the ability to just add space very quickly. Now, when we're thinking about the hive itself and how it's oriented, you should really be thinking about the hive as, as kind of two components. So you have the area down below, which is where your animal lives. That's where the brood's being raised. That's where uh, pollen is being stored. That's where they're raising young. That's, that's where bees are hatching. Now, that is the area for the animal, and that is generally referred to as a brood chamber. Now, when we're talking about the overall hive itself, those top boxes that are above our animal is where the crop is being stored, and the crop that we are storing is honey. So when you're thinking about the orientation of the hive, the nice thing about beekeeping with the Langstroth hive, in, in my opinion, is that really you have this delineation of resources that's very stark. And so you can see in this orientation, this individual is using two deeps for their animal chamber and then mediums for their crop chamber. And that is a very regular orientation that we see with Langstroth hives. So this is our Langstroth hive here. Oh, and we're, <laughs> we'll jump right past that. So the, the big difference that you can find between Langstroth hives, and this also comes down to preference, is that you'll see eight and 10 frame equipment available. Now this is really a preferential thing. Um, I'll use an example for myself. So I started beekeeping with 10 frame equipment because that's pretty much what my mentor, all, all he used was 10 frame equipment. And so I started with 10 frame equipment. Now I'm also a disabled veteran and I have a back, knee and ankle injury from my service in the military. And over time, as I get older, it gets more and more difficult for me to lift those 10 frame boxes because they're just heavy. A 10 frame medium full of honey can weigh upwards of 50 pounds. Whereas the eight frame option allows me to kind of lighten that load a little bit and move those hives a little easier. They're smaller, so obviously if, you have, if you're using eight frame equipment, you're gonna have to have maybe an, a couple extra boxes to accommodate for that loss of two frames in each box. Um, but overall, they function the same, um, but you do have the advantage of letting a little weight off of yourself um, by using the eight frame orientation. Uh, some folks really like the 10 frame. If you're doing in frame, in, uh, in high feeders, like the frame feeder, a 10 frame option is probably more reasonable. Um, whereas with the eight frame, you're gonna be losing a lot of space by including a, a feeder in there. Now, you have different sizes of boxes that you can purchase. Mediums and deeps are the typical boxes that we have. Um, and really, the difference between the two, a lot of folks really like the deep boxes for brood chambers. It helps with that clear delineation between the animal and the crop. So you use your deeps for your brood chamber and your mediums for your honey supers. Now, Again, um, this is also preference. So if you do wanna use mediums for everything, and I, I use this in my own apiary, I use eight frame mediums for everything in our, in our apiary um, because of my lifting restrictions. Um, if you're using mediums, you just need to realize that you know, you're, you're gonna have to understand the difference of where that animal uh, section ends. Now for us, usually three mediums or, or sometimes four will accommodate that brood chamber, but you're just gonna have to add a little more equipment if you're gonna be using the medium boxes over the deeps. But if you're new to beekeeping, oftentimes having that clear delineation between deeps and mediums is very useful for you to understand where that brood chamber ends and where the honey supers begin. Now, inside of those, uh, those hive bodies that we just saw in that last slide, you're gonna have frames, and those frames are gonna come in different sizes as well. So you're gonna have deep frames and medium frames for those, and they have to be matched appropriately. If you were to put a medium frame in a deep hive, they will fill that out with comb, but it will be comb that will be generally, brew, or generally drone comb, and it really creates a mess when you have these vacant areas. The bees will fill those areas uh, with, with comb, um, and oftentimes it's not in the orientation you would like. 
The frames are gonna have foundation on them as well. The foundation is basically the architecture that the bees build comb off of. And there are lots of options. You have plastic foundation, wax foundation, and some folks even go foundationless. Now, the difference between plastic foundation and wax foundation, both of them work very well. The big thing with plastic foundation is you need to make sure that it is properly coated with wax. Now, they sell them pre-coated. A lot of beekeeping supply companies do sell them pre-coated. And that is, that's great, but you can also add a little wax to them as well, just with kind of painting some melted uh, beeswax on them. Um, but you can also see that it's important to realize that um, with wax foundation, it is, there is an installation process that goes along with that. You have to actually wire in the, the wax foundation so that it is strong enough when you extract so that it doesn't blow out. Now, foundationless can be a big problem. You see this, this kind of bridge comb down here on this uh, bottom uh, picture here. If you're going foundationless, or in this situation, we probably were seeing a situation where the frames were not properly spaced, so there was too much space between the two frames, and the bees just kind of filled that cavity with a mass of comb, or perhaps maybe there wasn't enough wax on there. Um, but essentially, when you're using foundation, um, as long as there's plenty of wax on the plastic or wax, you should be fine. Foundationless, however, will just create a mess. Um, you're not gonna be able to easily work your hives. They're going to just put wax and, and comb where they want to. And it's gonna, they're gonna fill it to bee space, which is about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch. Um, but it's oftentimes not in the orientation that you want it to be. So uh, plastic or wax foundation, definitely the way to go. And you can see this right here. This is improper spacing. So the last thing you should be doing when you close up those beehives is making sure that those frames are properly spaced. And that's what you saw as that last slide, that resulting uh, burr comb coming off of there, a bridge comb between those two frames um, is a result of improper spacing. So the last thing you should do when you close up your hive is make sure that those frames are pressed to the center. Now, you also want to have hive stands. Um, the big thing about hive stands is that you should not get hung up on what you're putting your beehives on. Uh, they just need to be elevated so that they're away from predators that are on the ground and that there's an air gap in between them and the ground. Now, the big thing to keep in mind is that you can use, like I said, just about everything. You see this picture on the left. This is what we use in, in my apiary and pretty much all of our MSU apiaries is just a couple of cinder blocks. You're talking about $3 worth of equipment right there. Or you can build something like this box over here made out of wood. You can use pavers. Lots of folks use pallets. Um, you know, uh, Megan had mentioned earlier that she used a tire at one point. So you can use just about anything to get it off of the ground. Don't get hung up on these real expensive hive stands. You really don't need much. You also have bottom boards. So this is literally the bottom portion of the hive. This is where your hive bodies sit on. It is also where the bees will enter and exit the hive from. So you have your bottom board landing, which is the front of that hive, and that's where the bees will take off and alight from. Now, bottom boards come in lots of different uh, flavors. You see the left one over here is a solid bottom board. We also see screened bottom boards a lot of times that are oftentimes used for monitoring mite drop. And then the picture that we have here on the right is of a uh, probably a four-way pallet. So that's, a, that's actually a bottom board that's incorporated into a pallet. This is primarily used by commercial beekeepers because they lift these pallets up onto trucks and ship their bees around the country. So it's nice to have that, that bottom board as part of that pallet so that you're not dealing with an individual piece of equipment uh, like we do with the normal bottom boards. But whether, it, whether it's a solid bottom board or screened bottom board, don't get hung up on that. They all work just fine. As far as a top cover is concerned, you're going to have to put something on top of your beehives. Um, so one thing you want to make sure is they're not exposed to the elements. Now, you can buy a telescoping cover like this one pictured on the left here, which has the metal cover to it. Um, very nice. Um, they're, they're a little expensive, but they, they keep your bees dry and away from the, the elements. But you don't have to really get hung up on that. Migratory covers are usually just a plain sheet of wood. Um, I use these in my own apiary because they're very cost effective, but really you just need something to cover the hive. So don't get hung up on, you know, whether it needs to be a telescoping cover or a migratory cover. The idea is, is that you're just protecting the hive from the elements and, and from robbers as, as well. So just something to keep them, them contained in there and protected.
The inner cover. So inner covers are things that are generally used with telescoping covers. Uh, migratory covers do not utilize inner covers, but really the, the inner cover serves a couple of different purposes. Lots of inner covers will actually have a notch in them to allow for a top entrance as well. But generally the inner cover is allowing for some airflow and it also allows for giving you a proper B space on that top uh, top set of frames that this is sitting directly upon. Um, so, so the inner cover is a functional piece of equipment as, as either a um, kind of something to give you a little bit of an air gap, potentially a top entrance. But also, um, if you are using migratory covers, you, you generally do not use an inner cover. I mean, you, you would not use an inner cover with a migratory cover. So again, it can just be something as simple as a sheet of plywood on top of your beehives. It does not have to be a fancy cover. And if you know any commercial beekeepers, you will be very hard pressed to find a commercial beekeeper who is using any sort of thing other than just a plain sheet of wood. All right, so um, necessary supplies as you get ready for your beekeeping season, you're gonna have to have feed and that's gonna be in the form of sugar or protein or and, and protein patties. So sugar are your car carbohydrates, protein patties are obviously your protein and protein is critical for the development of young bees. So this protein is gonna be fed to those young bees as they're developing. So make sure that when you're thinking about feed that you're, you understand that you have two different sources of feed, a carbohydrate source and a protein source. Now when it comes to sugar, make sure you're just getting dry granulated sugar. The white uh, refined sugar is what you want. Don't, don't waste your money on the really expensive whole foods, kind of all the minerals, organic sugar. Uh, those minerals that are in that, those sugars are not digestible by bees. And so you need to have the refined sugars because they, are, they really have all of those minerals taken out of them. You're also gonna need to have a plan for varroa mite. And that is going to be your biggest, op your biggest job during the season is monitoring, treating varroa mite. So do your homework on what mite treatments are available and what you would like to use as an option. And there are many different options out there, uh, depending on, on what you, you wanna do and, and what time of the season and temperatures um, that you're, you're facing. So make sure that you read the labels of those varroa mite treatments because they do have, a lot of them do have temperature uh, ranges that you need to use. You also need to make sure that you have honey processing equipment. So you, don't, you may not need to purchase honey processing equipment in the form of an extractor. And in fact, if you're a new beekeeper, I would encourage you not to, but you need to, you need to make a connection with someone who does. And generally that's where your local bee clubs are gonna come in. There are several bee clubs that actually rent out extractors to their membership. So make sure that you just have a plan for that, but don't invest a lot of money in an extractor to get started. And definitely don't throw away a few hundred dollars on one of these hand crank extractors because uh, as you grow in size, and, uh, and, and your labor requirements increase because of the more honey you're pr uh, processing, that hand crank uh, extractor is going to get pretty tiresome. Okay, so I think, right. thanks Adam for that. I think um, I'm just gonna do some uh, highlights reel and then quick hit the message or the question boards. Um, so, need to have a large volume hive for Michigan. So some of the hives, so like the Warre hives or the Kenyan ones, are going to be too small. Um, as long as it allows you to have a large volume, it's going to be easier. The Langstroth is just going to be easier. You can totally do any of the alternative ones. It's just going to be a little more difficult for you. There's a couple questions about the Sylvanian or the Ash hives. Those you can actually make quite big. Um, depending on the particular setup that you have. Um, generally the bees, they can do just fine in that as well. As long as it is basically a structure that is a container that has space for the comb, it's going to be fine. Things that don't matter are the style of the bottom board, the style of the hive stand, the style of the lid, all that stuff, just do whatever you want as long as it's fulfilling the basic function of providing the bees with a safe um, cavity. There is um, a question, let's see, about, oh, there's been a couple people that have asked about the boxes, different colors. The color of the box also goes in the category of things that don't matter. Um, do whatever you want for box color. There's a question about the, the size of the brood nest for Michigan. So with the Langstroth hive in Michigan, is the base best to be a deep and a medium or to be deep? 
both of those are fine. There are strategies for managing brood nests in northern climates. So in Ontario, they use a single deep. In Minnesota, they often use three deeps. In Michigan, they use two. Um, there's not going to be a perfect way to do it. Again, the best recommendation is to work with a beekeeper, learn what they do, and then um, kind of follow that system because you can use different, you can use different systems. I would say the standard in Michigan is to have two deeps, which is the equivalent of three mediums. Um, somewhere in that range is going to be appropriate. There's a question if there's a standard ratio for brood boxes to honey boxes, like one to three or one to four. It's not going to be a ratio and you're not going to be able to choose how much honey the bees bring in. If you don't want a big colony, that's not really up to you. The bees are going to bring in honey um, and it's on you to have a lot of extra boxes on hand to um, deal with that incoming honey. Um, there is a question about marking on the frames. How long do frames last? We recommend that you switch out your frames like 10 to 20% every year. So frames should last kind of like five-ish years, depending if they raise brood in them. But that's kind of a nice, like you count on your boxes lasting between five and 10 years and your frames kind of lasting between five and 10 years. Um, a question, do you recommend a spacing tool for new beekeepers? No, um, you can do, you can purchase all sorts of toys, but you can space the frames quite well using the ears if you have the Langstroth frames and just kind of eyeing them to be particularly spaced. Um, so the spacing between the frames is going to be maintained at bee space. And as long as it's even, that's going to be um, the most important thing. There's a question that, is it critical for a hive to be level? I hope not because none of mine are. Um, it is important if you are doing foundationless and you want the bees to draw their own comb, um, but that is going to be, um, it, yeah, the, it, that's not going to be one of the most important things. All right. Um, so those are all the equipment related ones. A lot of the questions about when to feed and how to feed and um, a lot of those we're going to answer in the next class. So if I haven't answered your question, um, it might be because we're going to, to do that either later in this talk or moving on. Um, Adam, you good? Still doing site selection? Sure thing, Megan. All right, so what makes a good beekeeping uh, a site for your apiary? So there are a few things that you need to consider when you're selecting a site. Um, but the big thing is, is don't get too hung up on a lot, uh, a lot of things as far as, you know, what direction they're facing. I generally, um, when I'm looking for a beekeeping site, there's a few key things that I really look for, but most of them are related to my own personal protection. Can we go to the next slide there, Megan? So what, what really matters? Well, the big thing is, is that it's safe for you. You're going to be walking around carrying equipment, and the last thing you need to do is have tripping hazards around. So oftentimes, B, apiaries are in remote locations. If there's been trees or you know, saplings that have been taken down and there's little stumps around, those are very dangerous for you as a beekeeper. In addition, if you are carrying a box full of bees, a hive body full of bees, and you trip, that's going to be a mess and uh, not something that you're going to enjoy, nor the bees are going to enjoy. Make sure it's a safe place for people and animals. So your bees are going to be coming out of the hive, and generally when they come out of the hive, they, they come out straight for about 20 or 30 feet, and then they'll start elevating up in, into the air. Now, that transitional area where they're coming straight out of that hive, you don't want that facing any sort of pedestrian traffic, or if you have livestock that are confined in an area or pets that are in a, you know, a kennel run or something like that, you don't want your beehives facing directly towards them. Or if it's close to the back door of your house, you don't want it facing right at the back door of your house. So just be aware of that. In addition, you need to have vehicle access. One of the things that I think that I made a big mistake of when I was first starting beekeeping is this idea that I could just drive my truck somewhere and then carry my equipment in. Uh, that may work if you've got one or two beehives, but over time that gets tiresome. 
None of us are getting any younger. So make sure you can pull your vehicle up because you are going to be bringing equipment out to that apiary constantly. Whether you're harvesting honey or whether you're bringing boxes out, um, you need to make sure that you can get that vehicle pretty close to those beehives. It's coming, folks. The next slide is on. It's, oh, here we go. Convenient. Okay, so make sure that it's convenient as well. Um, one of the big things that you need to be aware of is that you are going to have to maintain these hives pretty regularly. And so making sure that you don't have to drive several hours to get to them is important because the reality is, is that we all get busy. And if they're several hours away from them, the likelihood that you're going to make that decision on a Saturday afternoon to go drive a couple hours to maintain your bees, uh, you know, over time, that's going to get old. And um, having them close by is important, especially if something were to happen, you know, say, for example, if you had a bear attack, uh, your beehives, um, you're going to make want to make sure that you're able to get out to them uh, relatively quickly and be able to get some eyes on them regularly so that they're not just sitting out there in a field by themselves uh, with no maintenance. Uh, electrical fences are a really important part of beekeeping if you live in remote areas. I live in the Upper Peninsula and we have bears everywhere up here. That electrical fence is, is as important as anything else in that apiary because it is, it is what keeps those predators away from our hives. So what doesn't really matter? Well, the sunlight hitting the hives really doesn't matter. Um, you can have them in shaded areas. A lot of times I put my apiaries on wood, uh, wood edges, uh, so they are definitely getting shade during a, a period of the time. I like to get my hives to have a little bit of sunlight during the day, but it's, they don't have to be in direct sunlight um, all the time. The cardinal directions the hives are facing are really not that important. Um, one thing that I generally use as a rule of thumb is that if you have a prevailing wind direction, I normally will not face the opening of the hive towards the prevailing wind direction. So say if you have an easterly wind, you want to make sure that you're not facing right at that. Uh, you want to also make sure that you understand the landscape around you, but don't get too hung up on it because bees forage for food for miles. So if you don't have uh, pollinator habitat or, you know, good forage right next to you, the chances are that within a, a couple mile radius you do. Um, so just make sure that if, if you are beekeeping, um, that you understand that your bees are going to be traveling quite far for their food resources. And you have even situations like this, you know, where despite this being in a shaded area, this is kind of dappled sunlight that these hives are in. These colonies made it, made plenty of honey. They thrived all season long. Um, so don't get hung up on, on, you know, location so much. This is another example of how hives are facing. So these are basically in a circle and the hives are facing out. So again, all facing different directions. No, no real, you know, uh, close attention paid to one certain direction. So don't get hung up on those, uh, those uh, particular uh, things. And then this is an example of forage availability. So these are colonies that are in a corn and soybean field. You can see that around them is essentially a, a completely vacant landscape at this point. But beyond those fields, there is forage available for them. And these beehives did just fine uh, in this landscape. Okay, so I think Anna's got some uh, personal experience to talk about with rooftop apiaries. Yeah, so I used to work in a program in Minnesota where we had lots of beehives on rooftops in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, I think in a lot of ways it can look really cute. They make for really great photo ops, but it can be really difficult to manage bees that are on rooftops. So one of the ideas to put them on the rooftop is that you don't have the bee traffic um, in the way if there's a lot of people in the surrounding area. But bee equipment can get really heavy and it can be hard to move bee boxes or boxes full of honey up and down staircases, through windows, up and down ladders. And so normally I would say if, do everything you can to avoid doing this if you'd want to do it in the future, try with the beehives on the ground first and then get a feel for it before you try to get into rooftop beekeeping. All right, thanks, um, Adam and Anna. So Mike had a really good question about that most of the pictures have either a brick or a rock or a strap around the hives. 
um, and I'm guessing that's important. You do want to make sure, especially with telescoping covers, um, they can blow off in the wind or an animal can knock them off. So, but it, again, a brick, ratchet strap, rock is basically all you need to keep those on. Um, so we are a little over time, but I think we have just trying to do a highlight of keeping season. And then um, we'll try to answer the rest of the questions. And then keep in mind that this is really to tell you what to kind of purchase. And then the next class, we're gonna get a lot more into what you would do when you actually have your bees. So hopefully by the end of tonight, you have a good sense of what equipment you need to have, pros and cons, and then um, where, how you can have your hive set up so you'd be ready for if or when your bees come. So your goal as the first year beekeeper is to make sure that your colony is ready to go into winter. Because for us, success as a beekeeper means that you have a strong colony come springtime. So when I define winter, I'm going to use that by basically the first frost. And by that time, you should have your comb drawn out fully, which is really, really important. You need to have a large cluster of bees. The mites need to be completely managed. And you want a young queen with sufficient food. So everything you're going to do this year is going to be with your eyes on that prize. So you're going to make sure you're drawing out locks of wax. And again, we're going to talk about this in detail in the next one. Um, we're going to make sure that our bees are going to be totally healthy. And we're going to make sure that that hive is full of food. So you're going to be working this whole season to kind of reach that goal. And knowing that there's a very big difference between your colony this year and your colony next year. So this is a slide that shows one of our lovely native bee plants, Monarda fistulosa or bee balm. And this is it its first year on the left hand side and it's really small because it's taking that whole first year to put all of its effort into roots. Later is when you get the flowers in the third, fourth, fifth and going on years. When you're getting your honeybee colony, your first year is just getting it established. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people who have, um, you know, colonies that they just keep perpetually getting them started. On and to get that queen to overwinter, and then you're going to have a normal colony. All right, so what we feel like your goal should be for this year is you're going to feed the colony to get the hive established in the beginning. So you're going to get your package or nuke, you're going to get it so that you're feeding it so that it draws out wax, you're going to be adding space to it throughout the season and getting it to draw out wax, you're going to manage mites, at some point you're going to draw off those honey supers and then feed it before winter. And again, like we're going to go through this a lot over the next course. Our goals for this year. The first thing that's really important to be a beekeeper is to understand the nectar flows. What I mean by that is you have to have a good sense of what food is available for your air in your area. So everything you're going to do is going to be filling in for the times when your bees don't have food. So if you have a lot of food coming in in June, that's great. You won't necessarily have to support the bees in that time. So there's not a sense of being a beekeeper without also being a botanist. So just paying attention, taking photos of things that are blooming, learning your honey plants, and knowing what's in your area. Your second goal is to be able to identify everything in the hive. By the end of your first year, and ideally you're doing this before your first year, but for those of you starting this year, you have to know what is a queen cell, what is a drone cell, what is a worker cell. And you need to know the difference between healthy and sick. So you need to say, my colony is in good shape, I don't need to take action, or my colony is not in good shape, I need to call in the big guns, I need to send a photo to extension, I need to ask my mentor, I need to ask questions at my um, bee club so that I can make sure that I get my colony back and healthy. You will have to manage and monitor for Viverola mite, and we'll talk about that during the next class. Um, but there is no beekeeping in this era without dealing with the mites and the viruses that they transmit. And then you need to have an understanding about whether or not you have a queen disease. So these are really good things for you to start writing up or reading up on as we um, approach the beekeeping season. 
All right, so, um, and I think all the panelists can respond. I'm gonna dismiss some of the questions that are related to the management of the packages, um, just because they we're gonna deal with that at length. Um, Sid has a really good question. How can you suggest the keeper have and why? Um, the standard number is usually between two and four. Um, so usually two or three colonies is what you want. One is going to be really difficult because one is going to be, um, it's, you're not gonna be able to have them support each other. Two or three is really reasonable. When you start, you know, you don't wanna start with 10 because it's just going to be um, much too difficult for you. Um, Let's see, slatted rack above the bottom board, yes, no, or why? For slatted racks, I mean, it's not necessary. That is a preference thing, so that, that's a tool that you can use and add to the colony. Um, Rusty Burlew, who writes the blog Honey Bee Sweet, S-U-I-T-E, has a really lovely discussion on um, slatted racks, if you want. Um, there's a question about, um, making equipment and for cutting out jigsaw and stuff like that. The Michigan Beekeepers Association has a website and it has an in the beekeepers workshop um, part on there. So if you look for the resources for beekeepers and that has tons of information on how to, to make frames and things like that. Um, so I think what we'll do is there's a couple other, most of the questions that are here are dealing with how to manage talent. I think there's other ones about kind of what equipment to buy and people feel pretty good about at least being ready for their bees to show up. Um, I think all the night, I really do appreciate everyone's patience um, as we dealt with the technical issues and, and learned how to deal with all of this. Um, actually, there's a really good last question. Should we wait until next season to start as new beekeepers with all the chaos? <laughs> that is probably a really nice one to end this one. I mean, my recommendation with, with everybody is to wait until you're really confident and ready to get bees and really do reach out to the beekeeping clubs. Um, and especially once you can, we can do in-person meetings again, take this lovely blessed time that we have to be indoors and really focus on reading and read the beekeeping books, check out the website that we have, all of the resources that we have, read Bee Culture, read American Bee Journal, and then this summer, as soon as we can do it safely, make sure that you spend as much time as you can in your bees, that's going to, or in somebody else's bees even better. And that's gonna be the thing that makes a big difference. Um, so I really appreciate everyone listening and for sticking with us through this. And hopefully we'll see you all um, for the next class. Thank you.